Hello, everyone. Welcome to Global Chamber in New York. Thank you for joining us for, for this very special webinar about best approaches in public speaking. Today, we invited very special, amazing speakers that will share their secrets of public speaking with us. We have Jane Lutz, professional speech trainer and speech language therapist with experience over 25 years. Uh, we have Peter Gleason, attorney specializing in civil rights and criminal defense, who will share his secrets on how to be effective in public speech. And we have Kenneth Goodwin, uh, president of Genetics Capital and professor of Baruch College. He will talk about the importance of proper public speaking in the world. Our moderator host, the one, the only, Patsy Azar. Thank you. Well, good morning. I am Patty Azar, and I am thrilled to be here simply because today we are changing our entire format. We've upgraded all of our broadcast medium. We're going to an interactive format. So if you're out there listening to us today live, you're really very fortunate because you can send in, you can sign into the chat room, you can send in some questions for our experts. And what I'm so thrilled about is that Tatiana always does a great job but today she actually put together a topic that you don't really hear too much about. You hear about communication all over the world, whether you're standing up in front of your church, you're talk, trying to sell a widget, or you're trying to sell a service. But we've got three folks here that are gonna tell you about public speaking in the cross-border world, which is very different than just communicating. So let's get going today. And Jane Lance, I want to introduce her simply because she is an author. She has a lot of, of experience out there. And so Jane, talk to us about the magnificent um, experience you have out there and how in the world did you get to training corporate executives about how they communicate and how they speak to large audiences? Thank you. And thank you, Tatiana and Patty, for including me in this great panel on a topic I'm pretty passionate about. My background is as a speech language pathologist. And for people around the globe, it's called different things. But I worked in healthcare, working with very sick people, people that had strokes, brain tumors, Parkinson's disease, all those unpleasant illnesses, neurological issues that needed speech therapy to improve. And after doing that for many years, after uh, working as an adjunct professor and supervisor at New York University in New York, I discovered a niche in my field of speech pathology called corporate speech pathology. And my life changed that day because I took all my skills and I said, the light bulb moment went off and I said, now I can work with healthy professionals and help them advance their careers by building their communication skills. Within my business, we have a very strong niche in working with the international professionals who come to the United States from around the globe. They speak English with an accent, a strong accent, a medium accent. And if they need to polish their communication skills, we are called upon to do this so that we can not just build their clarity, but build their confidence in the workplace. And that last note, the confidence, is something that is so tremendous and it resonates with people around the globe. Well, I love that because I, we, we have a belief that confidence is all tied to your ability to speak uh, clearly, decisive, decisively uh, and to whatever audience who you're talking to there. So you have, you have the, uh, the niche. Do you have a niche inside of the international market? Do you just work with manufacturers? Do you work with service? Who do you work with out there? We have a very large niche in working in the financial industry. Okay. Uh, 
CPAs, accountants, investment bankers, um, the whole gamut. Part of that, I think, came because I spoke at the New York State Society for CPAs for eight consecutive years. But also, I think that there's such a demand for strong communication skills on the telephone, video conferencing, meetings, that that's the industry that seeks us out. However, we that extra percentage, probably 20%, comes from everything. Yesterday, we signed someone up who's a waiter in New York City and wants to be promoted to management. And he knows that's his next step. And he hired us to improve his spoken communication skills. We also work a lot with the IT technology field. Um, you know, in today's world, Patty, everybody, everybody has to come from behind their computer if yes. they want to move up the corporate ladder. So those two fields in particular, CPAs and financial people and IT that may have gone into these businesses to be quiet and be by their computer all day, every single career to move up the corporate ladder, you will have to go out and get clients, you will have to get on the telephone, you will have to speak in a meeting. So spoken communication skills become more and more important and necessary to move up the corporate ladder. I love when you're talking about the finance folks and the IT people because I'm sure you're telling them not only to speak in subject matter expertise speak, but to be able to talk to directly and concisely about the application of their services that they're offering and also the value that they bring. So I would, I would believe that's part of the great gift that you give them. You get them out of their head about having to be the subject matter expert. Absolutely. Uh, we have so much fun when I do my presentations and my trainings because I really do speak about that. And I tell them, if you put so much information into one thought bite, right. your listener is, it, it's going to be lost unless you're dealing with geniuses all day long. And that's one of the questions I ask to my audience. Are you speaking to geniuses on a daily basis? And obviously most people laugh because they're not. And if we're not geniuses, we kind of need to get it in small sound bites, like you said, concisely and delivered in a way that resonates with the listener. Well, I love that because also because if there's a different way you communicate to a contact center agent than you do a CEO, then you do a director in an organization. So the, the impact to how you're hearing it on the ears is so critical. So I'm sure that you guide folks in those areas too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, you talk about this accent reduction thing and you probably can hear I'm not from New York and I have done everything that I can do not to lose my authenticity, but not to sound like my Southern mother. Mm -hmm. So uh, talk to us about the need to stay authentic and at the same time understand about accent reduction. I, I would love to. My typical question that comes to me in a, in a phone call or an email is, I want to get rid of my accent. There is such a passion. And my response, 100% of the time, is why would you want to lose your accent? It's who you are. It's your ethnicity. It's your culture. And similar to what you just said, I always reference my New York accent. <laughs> I have a New York accent. We all have an accent. And in that first call, I tell the prospect, the client, let's get on the same page. My goal for you, you know, I obviously um, ask them questions to find out why they have that burning need to eliminate their accent. And 99.9% .9 of the time, it's because they're frequently asked to repeat what they just said. They're frequently asked where they're from. So I'll address that. I then share with them that it's not about eliminating your accent. Nobody's asking you to, but just like native English speakers, we all do need to be responsible, especially in the global market, for being clear and articulate in, uh, to our audience. And when I explain that to, to the people, they, they, you almost 
hear that visible sigh of relief because they really didn't want to get rid of their accent. But people have asked them to repeat so many times, they feel battered. The other thing I've learned from, from clients, which I think is so sad, is they say they're asked the question, where are you from? And for them, they feel that it's, it's saying, oh my God, I, I hear your accent. Where are you from? And I try to explain to people, I just did it in a big training on Monday, that it's, it's a, an icebreaker. It's how to get to know somebody. It's someone being interested. Where is that accent from? And then starting a conversation if you're meeting them in business or personal. And again, you see the visible sigh of relief when you tell people this. So accent reduction is not discrimination in any way, shape, or form. It's enhancing spoken communication skills for people around the globe so they can improve their business communication, they can move up the corporate ladder, they can feel better socially. There is absolutely only positive to gain when someone works on improving their spoken communication. Well, what I love about this too, because I'm sure that you put a lot of emphasis on this. Number one, know who your audience is. Do not use their slang, or our slang, whether it's me. Right. And then also words have real meaning. So with all of that, you know, you're, you're, you're working with people in terms of, you know, how they grew up and their ethnicity, their environments. Can people really change in terms of how they show up to the world? And how do you help them do that? Do you have like one, two or three tips that, you know, it's like, Anybody's listening today, if you just do this, this, and this, you'll be on the road to really supporting yourself. Well, first of all, if we couldn't change the way we speak, the fields of speech language pathology would not exist. <laughs> it is growing in leaps and bounds. I think if you Google on any Google site, Google Bing, whatever, and you look at fastest growing careers, it's in there. Really? Because the demands are tremendous. So, Yes, everyone can change anything almost about their communication. And also just to share, about four years ago, uh, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal called, Is This How You Really Talk? Yes. And I was featured in that article, and it was a spectacular article, not because I was featured in it, but because people from around the world read this article knew that they have a high-pitched voice, they mumble, they have a strong accent. They had no idea that they could change the way they speak. My phone rang off the hook for about two weeks. We still have a client um, in Hong Kong as a result of that article. And uh, people came to us for all different reasons. And I realized at that point, that so many people don't realize they can change the way they speak. Now, I'm speaking more about communication, so sure. to answer your question, let's shift that to the public speaking and give I some guess. tips on public speaking. Uh, and there are so many. I have a 10 memorable sh uh, tip sheet that I give out to all my clients, but my First, I'm going to give you my trifecta, the Love magic. It. Love the it. Magical. Number one, it's about vocal power. It's about learning how to project your voice. And again, public speaking, as my colleague said, Patricia Fripp, is everything we say when we leave our house in the morning. So if you think about it, it is when you talk on the phone, video conference, a meeting, and of course, speaking to 10, 50, or 100, or 1,000 people. So vocal projection is very important. The next in my trifecta is taking your time and delivering your message with great impact. People have a tendency to speak quickly and identify their personality with speaking quickly. So I don't wanna tell anyone to slow down. I want the entire audience to realize that they need to deliver their message with greater impact. 
Got it. And use a strategic pause. And last, it's about speaking clearly. It's finishing the ends of your words so that your listener doesn't have to figure out what you just said and then miss what you're saying next. Be, be slow, be clear, use a, a, a dynamic voice. All of this information, and I do want to share this just because it's so, I, I'm passionate about it, is on my website. We have a search bar for our six years of blogs. And if they put in vocal power, slow down, the pause, they can pull out the blogs from the website, which is Corporate Speech Solutions. Those three tips are important for everyone, public speaking, accent reduction, business communication skills. But to add a few more for public speaking across the world, around the globe, let's also talk about standing strong, owning your space. I have a little bit of a pet peeve about the person who paces back and forth and just gets your audience dizzy. Own your space and move with purpose. You can certainly move to the left and move to the right, but move with purpose. Use your voice, now that you have that vocal power, use it to engage your listeners. Nobody wants to listen to a monotone voice. You want people to use a dynamic voice. Engage your listener. And certainly use eye contact. No matter how many people you're speaking to, you want to connect to the listener. And last, uh, remember to open strong and close strong. I, oh, I never stand up and say, hi, my name is Jane Latz, because they already know that. <laughs> I start strong, I bring them in, and then if I'm going to do introductions with a small group, then, I will introduce myself, but first I want to engage my listener. That's just a few of my pearls. Well, I just love that because it's across the board. People are people are people, no matter where you're from. And all of those tips apply to anyone, no matter what their behavioral style is, no matter what their social economics are, their education. You've just given everyone the, the opportunity to, to build confidence in a one-on-one, -on -one, a small group, and then also into a public forum. Those are perfect. I'm, I mean, I wish the whole world was on here today because, well, <laughs> probably not for you because you wouldn't have any business then. And because, <laughs> hey, well, we don't need it because we just got all the pearls. But those are so wonderful because they're practical. You can put them in place today. There's, there's nothing uh, airy-fairy about it, and there's nothing mystical. Just do it. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's okay. The whole world can listen because as we <laughs> all know, as we all know from anything that we give away and we tell, many people still need their coach to really guide them through learning how to master. So let the world listen to this webinar. I'd be happy. Well, you know, uh, Jane, uh, we just had a really, we've had some questions come in, but this is a trending question. You know, what techniques might you alter depending on the culture of the audience? And are you speaking of skills just in the USA? I think we may have just addressed that, but that was such a good question. I thought we'd throw that one up. Yeah, that is a good question. Uh, when so many of my clients are here in the United States, I actually just did a training in the UK last week, mm -hmm. and every single tip that I just gave, we worked on in that training. We worked on the 10 memorable. We worked on all of that. Having said that, there are certain things, for example, the eye contact, personal space that is different in other parts of the globe. But for anyone from around the globe that is doing business in the United States and certainly New York, every one of those tips is not only relevant, but important to the delivery of any presentation. I believe you. So I've got a personal question here just from me. When folks um, step on themselves, 
they do not clearly communicate and they recognize that how do you help them how do you coach them to say okay that happened and this is how we move on because I'm sure you see that because I'm sure you have role plays and you help folk, folks through video and all of that whenever someone trips up as I think is what you were just saying yes. I always compare it my office is right in the middle of New York City and it's a brief walk from the subway and I tell my clients there is no way that I can never tell someone you will never trip on the streets of New York City again. It's a way of life. You walk, your foot gets caught in the uneven cement and you trip. The same thing is always going to happen in speaking, in public speaking, in small meetings. Everyone is going to trip up at one time or another. It's how you react to the fall and how you react to the trip. The most beautiful, most elegant way is continue you know take a pause breathing is your best friend when you are speaking we do so much on breathing i stopped someone last week in the uk who was so nervous because we were videotaping and i said just take a breath take a minute breathe and she went on to give an elegant pitch for her product that she was preparing so it's how we gain control after we've tripped up. But breathing is your best friend. Pause and take a breath. That's so interesting because all the higher masters of the spiritual of the spiritual mediums out here, they all say take a breath. Breath is so important. So there you are, Miss Jane Latz, talking about taking a breath and being able to bring back your composure. But I do have one other trending question before we move over to Peter, is that is there one country that you found that um, had the most differences and maybe the toughest or the biggest trend that you could see that uh, was difficult to overcome some of the advice you were, were they able to adopt your advice? And um, did you see trends in one country you say, you know what, if I'm gonna go into this country, I might need to know that. See, I just stepped all over myself then. <laughs> <laughs> There are several accents or countries with different dialects that are quite challenging. The, the goal or the, the, the success, the success comes from two things, no matter how challenging someone's speech dialect may be. One is the quality of the instructor, and I am so fortunate to be blessed with a wonderful team of some very, very talented instructors. All are speech pathologists. And the real work is how hard the individual works to make the changes, whether it's an accent or just you know business communication skills or even public speaking. It's the practice. And it's the same as in any sport, learning a musical instrument. The more you practice, the greater the success will be, no matter where in the world you come from and the challenge of your dialect. Okay, I know this is terrible, but I got to put you on the spot here because it's coming in. How are you able to come back from your biggest bluff or not bluff, but your biggest mistake? when you did a public speaking, when you were a public speaker, did you ever have anything that you're saying, oh my gosh, I just can't believe I did that? Uh, you know what, I, thankfully, <laughs> I haven't. The one thing I will share that I think every single solitary person in the audience has experienced is, I get very passionate when I'm storytelling and when I'm doing a presentation. And, Sometimes I'll go off and I'll tell a story and then I forget where <laughs> I was. Yes. And I think we all could appreciate that. So there's two ways to deal with that. One, again, use the pause as your best friend, take a breath, and sometimes all of a sudden it comes back. Or be very human and turn to the audience and say, where was I? I got so excited about the story I was telling, I totally forgot where I was. Everybody laughs, someone tells you where you were, and you all have fun and move on. 
Oh my, I do that all the time. So that makes me feel so good if you're around the world teaching people that I'm a okay when I do that. Very, very good. Okay. Just real quickly, what's the best presentation that you've seen in a, in a while? Wow, <laughs> that's a great question. I, <laughs> that's a very, that's a, that's a little challenging. You know, my occupational hazard is I, see a lot that are not the best that I've ever seen. Yeah. And um, friends and colleagues of mine are always saying, oh my God, they need your card, they need your card. Um, I, I haven't seen one recently that I can really um, tell you stood out. I'm, I'm, it. Yeah, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> no, that's no problem. That's no problem because I think of Ted and I think of all these folks that are up there now. And right. so, but I just love this because you're so accessible to everyone. You're accessible to the waiter. You're accessible to the CEO. You're accessible to the frontline manager because these skills are universal. And it's just so exciting to hear all this. And right. I could talk to you for hours and days, but I've got to move on to Peter because he is an attorney. And I've got to find out his background because attorneys are supposed to be the best in terms of asking the right types of questions and how they apply to cross-border public speaking. So, Peter, good morning. How are you today? Good morning, Patty. I'm doing great. How are you? I am just great. i got to ask you something. From an attorney's viewpoint, why is public speaking and the cross-border world so important to you? Well, it... It, you want to get your message out. You want to you want to get your point of view out and advocating for your clients. So that's that's the ultimate goal. Is when you're representing an individual, that individual has an agenda. Whether you're you're the plaintiff, whether you're the defendant, it doesn't matter. You want to get your point of you want to get your client's point of view across. And. So so um, from your perspective, because I've seen, I've had a lot of clients who have been attorneys and some of them are transactional, some of them are litigators. What's more important to you in terms of communication uh, internationally and through the cross border? Is it having stellar public speaking skills or having the platform? I think it's a little of both. And once you have the platform, then you can formulate your agenda and then you can craft your message. So it's a, it's a process that should work out to your client's benefit. So for example, if, uh, if you represent somebody that has a certain goal in mind, whether it's a, uh, you know, in a business setting, they have a goal in mind, you want to find out what the ultimate goal is. You want to then get your platform and then you want to go after your target audience. And there's a variety of ways to do that. There's obviously the old fashioned way you pick up the phone or you go through your Rolodex and now it's social media. Uh, you know, we're all connected somehow, some way. Uh, every time I'm looking for somebody, whether it's on LinkedIn or Facebook, you, you can go through the list of uh, individuals that that person is associated with and nine times out of 10, there's, there's some commonality there. And with that commonality, you reach out for an introduction and you also do some intelligence gathering. You find out what your target audience or the target individual is all about. And you can, uh, you can then uh, sit down with your client and formulate a strategy. So in your background, were you trained to be able to address folks, not just from a legal viewpoint, but also to be able to address them uh, successfully in a in a presentation format? Well, I, I mean, the way my career has evolved, when I was 20 years old, I became a New York City police officer. So at 20 years old, I was working in uh, Midtown Manhattan, in and around Times Square, before Times Square is what it is today. Uh, and uh, at a young age, it taught me how to deal with a variety of people from all over the world. And... Uh, you can you learn how to size people up. I think that's a very important thing. You want to size up your audience, whether your audience is one individual or is uh, is masses. And I've spoken to you know groups as large as a thousand. And you want to find out what the commonality is there, and you want to focus on that to grab their attention. Once their attention is grabbed, uh, you know it makes it it, may, it puts everybody in a more relaxed format. And when they're relaxed, they're more, uh, they're more amenable 
to, uh, you know, to, to learn your message or to hear your message. So you are really a great ambassador out there as a police officer, understanding how to connect with people. But when people see a police officer uh, uniform, I would think they would get get you would get my attention if you're asking me some questions. So how are you able? to take that type of really good community type of police uh, police officer uh, behavior out there to show folks that, let, look, I'm here to support you and I'm here to get the great understanding and how I can how I can help you to being an attorney, a practicing attorney. Well, you know, it's funny. I just had a meeting yesterday uh, with uh, representing a municipal employee. I won't say what agency it was. But based on my background, I mean, let's call it what it is. It's, it's inside baseball. I know how these agencies work. I know how the establishment works from the inside. So when the other the person on the other side of the table is trying to pull the wool over your eyes, you say, listen, I, you know, sometimes being candid is the best thing and say, listen, this is inside baseball. Please don't play me for a fool and tell me that this is occurring when in fact, the following is occurring because I have this insight into the into the manner in which you uh, you comport yourself uh, you know and you know sometimes I use I use the illustrious Frank Serpico as a great example Frank is a dear friend but I also call Frank in as an expert from time to time on certain cases and nine times out of ten just his name alone on a on a pleading or a, a letter saying that uh, we're putting the other side on notice that he is going to be an expert, stands the other side down because uh, to the chagrin of most, most attorneys, we live in a world where judges and adversaries like to say that is not plausible. But when you're dealing with somebody, say like a Frank Serpico, who, uh, you know, through his advocacy and his public speaking, uh, you know, he went from, he went from being labeled a, uh, you know, a disgruntled employee to then holding the city, uh, captivating the city with the, the NAP commission hearings back in the 1960s. And a lot has evolved through then. And, you know, quite honestly, Frank Serpico is probably the most recognizable member of, that the NYPD has ever, uh, has ever had. So it's, you know, with public speaking, to get to the point where you get their, you have to get their attention through something, and unfortunately, it's it's a long. Sometimes it's a long, drawn out process. Uh, you know, the Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book, I believe it was called The Tipping Point, where he essentially lays out the overnight success takes ten thousand hours, and ten thousand hours really translates into doing something a thousand hours a year for ten years. So this is interesting because you have really layered for your life the ability to, to build a competence based upon being a police officer, and then also becoming an attorney. Secondly, you're building your certainty uh, through being able to message and to have a platform of the right experts around you. And third, you've really been able to understand how to read your audience and then how to educate to your audience. It's almost like Jane was saying earlier, but just not as specifically in terms of where her experience has been, where yours has been. So, you know, also that I read that you really have a, a belief that rhetorical questions are important when you're communicating and then also when you're doing public speaking. Could you, could you give us some information about that? Sure. The, the, one of the greatest tools we have in our arsenal, if you will, is the rhetorical question because it, I can't tell you how many times you're able to have a group come full circle and come to support you when you ask the rhetorical question. So for instance, I had run for city council in the city of New York and uh, politics, as we've just seen with this presidential election, I mean, a city council race is a small microcosm compared to the presidential race. But when you meet with, the, and you, you are from time to time in politics going to meet with hostile groups. But when you can lay out a question for them, instead of sometimes the best answer to a question is another question in return. It's not usually acceptable in the practice of law, but in real life it is. So if you can lay out to somebody and say, well, what about this? Would you feel the same way if it was this? 
situation. The person, the logical person steps back and says, hmm, it's like, it's like the salesman. The salesman sits down with somebody and goes through their, goes through their sales pitch. And at the end of the sales pitch, when you ask the potential customer, does this make sense? And if the person says yes and they don't purchase that item, they internally feel like a fool because they've just admitted that something was good, something was correct, something made sense, and they're not buying it, so therefore then they don't make sense. So using the rhetorical question, uh, you know, for instance, we just had this uh, big to-do about the pipeline in Indian territory in the Midwestern United States. And let's be honest, there are Native Americans, that's sacred ground to the Native Americans, and there are Native Americans that are buried there. So the rhetorical question that some people put out on the internet was, would a pipeline through a military cemetery be acceptable? Clearly the answer is no. So why is a, why is a pipeline through a sacred Native American land? Why would that be acceptable? The rhetorical question makes people think, and that's what we need to do as a society. I think we may need to do a little more thinking out there. <laughs> so I love that. So before we jump in and start digging, digging holes for pipe, pipelines, we need to understand what all the implications are, what the cause and effect, the concept and the spirit of what we're trying to do out there. Sorry, I didn't mean to pun about the spirit, but uh, understanding what the impact there is to all parties. The same thing like Jane was saying, it doesn't matter what you're saying if, in fact, the parties don't understand it and you don't have your power of voice and you don't have your purpose. And so that's what I'm kind of hearing from you, too, I believe. Sure. And, you know, it, it's not making a political statement because once you talk, you know, they, they always say at a, at a dinner party, you never talk about religion or politics. But if you can make a rhetorical question and it applies to that and you can dance around, you know, the... Uh, the religious or the political ramifications of the question, it gets people thinking and it, it, it gets people talking. I believe it. I believe it. Gosh, Peter, I hate to move on, but I've got to move on because you've got such great information. Thank you so much. We're moving all around the world. And now I'm going to go over to Kenneth Goodwin because Kenneth's going to talk about some of the issues that he had in terms of uh, he's on the finance side of the world. You're on the money side of the world, aren't you, Kenneth? Yes, yes. How are you doing today, Patty? <laughs> the money side of the world, which is slightly uh, different than everyone else, but it's it's very direct and um, very straightforward, very concise. How are you doing today? I am just so great. Thank you so very much. Well, I, I see it just that totally in, in total alignment here because Jane talked about her 80% of her audience are folks who work with money. And so it's not just CPAs, it's people that are, you know, going out there, they're the VCs of the world and the people out there going out and putting deals together. But what I'm really so interested in is because you said you had a real experience that really taught you about public speaking outside of the U.S. Would you give us a background on that and then also in yourself and tell us what did you find out and what did you learn? Sure, sure. And Jane is one of my favorites. So I, I'm a big fan of her. So I uh, just want to let her know that. Uh, my, my experience actually occurred uh, when I went to Japan uh, on the uh, second time. That was about eight years ago. I was part of the Japan a financial service agency, the Japan FSA, uh, and I was diplomatically trained by the State Department of the United States. So that, that really helped in terms of public speaking, in terms of uh, patience, showing poise, uh, taking your time, as Jane mentioned, uh, breathing. Uh, also, one of the big things that I've learned is, is filling the room, filling the air, filling the audience. Uh, what was unique about this experience because it was a finance background, and it was individuals from different parts of the globe. So you had individuals from China, from Korea, uh, from Russia, uh, from, uh, of course, Japan, uh, Singapore. They all spoke in English. And what was unique about this was that their English, the, the actual tone and the actual words were from places where they study English from. So you had, you had the, the Singaporean speaking English from England, and you had the Chinese speaking English from 
uh, Mexico. It was just very unique to hear all these different dialects. And what was very unique, because everyone, English is not their native tongue. So what you had was a sense of pause and delay in the way they presented themselves. And I being a native English speaker, and I was at the forefront of the table, I took the time to sit back and I said, look, let's all just relax. And let's all just enjoy ourselves. And let's start off by talking about where we came from, how we got here. So storytelling was very, very critical in, in releasing and calming people down and allowing them to actually speak more. And so what it taught me, it taught me the first lesson that an ambassador told me. Uh, the ambassador said, you need to feel the room, feel the air of the room. Before you walk in the room, take the time to feel it and take the time to pause and just notice who your audience. So that's how you build up the confidence in the people. Yes. So that's the, that's the first thing I did. And it was, it was delightful. It started, people started to engage more uh, and actually people started to ask questions. So what you had was, even though the tone and dialects were off a bit, people still accepted each other individually. And that's more important in terms of communication. I, I absolutely love that because I love what you talk about filling the room, feeling the room, because feeling the room, folks understand that you care. You're 80% there when people know that you care about them. Secondly, that you have such a respect from where they came from. So you're almost talking about the typical icebreakers, understanding your room, feeling it, not just thinking it, but feeling it, giving people the opportunity to express themselves. And then, you know what, you kind of take away some of the angst and some of the fear of not being perfect. Exactly, exactly. Communications is a two-way dialogue. So that one of the key in communicating is being able to understand. And that takes not just having a poise, but also having the ability to listen. Uh, the Taoists, uh, Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu would say that speaking is not normal. So the idea of speaking, it allows you, you're using a lot of energy. So words are creative forces. That's so you right. have to be able to be prudent in the type of words that you use that's going to impact somebody else's lives. So it's, it's a moving force. So what, the one thing I recognize is that people, they were nervous. And of course, that's normal. That's a normal attitude for all folks have. They right. always, always start off to be nervous. And it's okay. I think it's, it's quite fine to be nervous. And, and if you're not nervous, then, then you are you're more than likely, as Jane would say, you may stumble, but you have to be able to roll back up again right. and find confidence. But that's part of being human. Exactly. And, and that energy is what needs to translate to the audience. You know, I really appreciate that about you, Peter and Jane, because what you've been talking about, number one, let's be authentic. I know that word authentic has been beat down so much, but it really is because if you come in and people say, okay, it's safe to be in your space, it's like, okay, now, so it might be safe for me to speak. And the creatives talk about in terms of what you're talking about, the Dallas, is that they say we live in an extrovert world. And so it's, the whole world is extrovert. So how are you able to work in that and manage it? And then how can you appropriately message to that? And so that people will engage with you. I would say then you probably had a tremendous outcome from that meeting. Is that a right assumption? That is a right assumption. It's, it's tough, actually. It's, it's a challenge because sure. in the working world, you're trained to be upfront, stern, concise, direct, and, and that's, that's the typical business world that you're trained to be in. They have a very deep voice. You know, the words are coming from your belly and it's, you're constantly changing the tone. Well, in the Eastern world, it's slightly different. Yeah. Uh, Nonverbal communication is very important. Right. So empathy and the slight twitch of the head over to show that you have a sense of listening. Those are the things that are really uh, being captured. And that, those are the things that I picked up immensely. And, and I'm still learning that. And I enjoy learning that from the audience. So not only are you teaching, but you also become the student. Well, I have a really great question here for you. And I'm going to ask you because when you really feel the room and you allow folks to participate without fear, were you able to come in and make a business case for you? 
were you able maybe to actually change their minds about something that they thought that were that were able to support you in your business efforts? Oh yes, uh, several occasions. I'll give you one very recently. I just yesterday I just went to the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, and we had to pitch on several deals. And the Hong Kong Trade. Let me just take a step back. The Hong Kong Trade Development Council is responsible for promoting all outbound businesses back to the mainland China and Hong Kong. So the purpose is to identify investors, asset managers who want to do business, of course, in China and, and inbound back here in the U.S. So yesterday we had a, a meeting. It was a private meeting. Uh, you had several investors, private investors, asset managers. You had several real estate uh, investment officers and the idea was to pitch different deals in preparation for the big event, the annual event that they have, what they call the Belts and Road Summit, which is going to be held in Hong Kong on January 17th. So this is a preparation for a big event. And what was interesting was that everyone presented their deals. Uh, and then, of course, I came up with mine. I had two particular deals that I knew on top of my mind that it was going to be quite difficult to really sell to the investors. Uh, one of the deals was based in New Zealand. Whoever thought that New Zealand is known for information technology at all places. So trying to convince the audience that, hey, there's a lot of several companies in New Zealand that are doing some great work on the IT side, yes. application software, hardware, they're in New Zealand, and New Zealand has a high network environment down there. It's, when you look at the demographics in New Zealand, that you have a population that's well known for high network, and that you have an investment base that's really growing. So it was really, really unique to convince them on that. And I said, well, if you think about how that became, you started to realize that New Zealand was working directly with India. So a lot of those companies from India actually work back office with New Zealand, which is the backbone for a lot of those IT firms. Right. The idea of actually starting off with a nice story, how it became, and then, of course, having a nice uh, middle ground, and then, of course, ended it off, uh, it kind of convinced the audience that, hey, there's a possibility of maybe investing in these firms in New Zealand. But again, you have to really start from the beginning to the end, and you have to really take your time. It's, it's a walk. It's not a run. It's actually it's a walk. And, and in doing that, people, you hope that people find the, the trust and the confidence, which is really the key, the trust and the confidence to believe in what you're saying. And that you have the certainty of what you're saying. Exactly. Well, that's what Jane was talking about. That's what Peter was talking about. You have to earn that credibility. Jane talked about you have to really walk your audience. You're saying the same thing. And so is Peter in terms of bringing in the, the right folks for him to say, no, look, we're, we, we know what we're talking about here. So we're not even going to go down that road. So, uh, Kenneth, before I let you go, and I'm going to go back to everyone, tell us about your organization and um, I know I've had the privilege of being able to talk to you twice. Tell, tell folks, too, how they can find you and what you do and what ROI you could drive for them. Sure, sure. We are Genensis Capital Markets, and we basically we work with firms, mainly small, mid-sized firms, who want to do cross-border advisory work in Asia. Our target audience is Japan, China, and Japan. Uh, Japan, excuse me, China and Korea. Uh, we work directly with government service entities. Those government service entities are JETRO. JETRO is the Japan Exchange Trade Organization, and they are part of the Ministry of, of, uh, Ministry of uh, Environment, Trade, and Industry in Japan. So they work directly with the government of Japan. Uh, we also work with COTRA. COTRA is the investment arm for the Korean government. And, of course, the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, which is the arm for the Chinese government. So this is a public-private uh, side to this. So we help these firms to do market segmentation. We also help firms to do product development. And, and on the back end, we help firms to raise capital because we want firms to operate uh, eventually in overseas markets. So our client base tends to be firms that are pretty much more mature. And when we say mature, we describe mature as a firm that's been operating anywhere between three and four or five years and above. 
uh, usually have anywhere between 15 to 20 employees and above, uh, a solid management team in place. Uh, they have a mission, they have a value, they have principles. Uh, so they know what they want to do in terms of uh, operating overseas. So we've done pretty well on that end in terms of advisory and raising capital. And, and the, the great thing is that you're constantly learning because these companies are growing. So they eventually, you hope to be there from the beginning to the end to watch them grow and mature in overseas markets. Well, I'll tell you, Kenneth, uh, they're very blessed to have you. You're perfect for this because you're into the art and the science of the human. Secondly, you understand what you're doing for the deal. And I love the fact that uh, you're all principle-based about if you win, everybody wins. And if you don't win, you know what I'm saying. So it's about really doing the right things right for folks. And it sounds like what you're putting together will make a difference in 10, 20, and 100 years. So thank you for all the work you do out there. Because I know if you do something, Things that it's going to impact my life out here too. Oh well, thank you. And and, and just to end it off, just to uh, finalize the uh, question that you asked, uh, you can reach me directly at Kenneth K E N N E T H Goodwin at Genensis dot net. That's the best way to reach me these days. Why don't you spell Genensis for us? Sure. I'm glad you asked that question because there's a story behind it. <laughs> <laughs> That's J E A. N E N S I S. Perfect, perfect. If, if worst comes to worst, we can always just Google Kenneth Goodwood, New York, right, and find you. That's absolutely correct. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kenneth, for your time today. And I want to go back to Peter because Peter, I know that you've got such depth and breadth about you in terms of what you do. I want you to be able to uh, tell folks how to find you and and who you can support out there. Well, I'm on, I'm on LinkedIn, but uh, my email address is probably the best way to get in touch with me is pjgleason at aol.com. Spell Gleason for us. And it's P is in Peter, J is in Joseph, Gleason, G-L-E-A-S-O-N. And Peter, why would they ask for you? Who would want to come in and, and, and what type of services would you provide for them? Well, you know, a lot of, a lot of my clients uh, come to me uh, as a last resort after they've been uh, maligned by the system, if you will. And, okay. And I'm happy, I'm happy to talk to anybody at any phase uh, of, their, uh, of their dilemma. Uh, but as civil, I said... Civil rights, those types of issues, correct? Civil rights and, uh, you know, after, after they've been ignored by the, the system... Uh, you know, I'm happy to sit down and talk to anybody. It's a real pleasure to meet with you today and to be able to host you today. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. And Jane Letts, you know what? You've got a book. You're an author out there. So let's talk to you real quickly. I want you to tell me about this book. And I want you to tell all these folks out there from the waiter to the CEO to anyone out there that can uh, utilize your services, Jane. Thank you. Uh, the book title is a long title, but it explains exactly what the goal is of reading that book. It's called Communicate Up the Corporate Ladder, How to Succeed in Business with Clarity and Confidence. And it is available on Amazon and Kindle. It is quick. It is easy. You don't even have to read it cover to cover. You can just go to the topic that you are interested in. I can be reached if you go to the website. It's corporate speech solutions with an S.com. And all the contact information is there. Or they can email me as well at Hopefully they can see the way my name is written. It's J-A-Y-N-E, which is a little different than many might think, at Corporate Speech Solutions with an S dot com. But it's very easy to reach me if they visit the website, which I think is a wonderful, engaging website. So go there first. I just love it. I love the fact that you tout the good things about you, all three of you. And I just think that's so wonderful. And it's such a great lesson for people out there when you've got something good on it. And so you work with individuals and organizations. I just want to be sure that everybody understands that. Thank you. Yes, yes.
Absolutely. Well, you are just a gem out there. And uh, I, my only problem with all three of you is that I'm not sitting right there with you so we could go get a cup of coffee and go get some good New York food. But but we're all in New York, so come visit and we can all go out together. We will, we will. And so I am Patty Azar, and I'm just so thrilled to be moderating this today, the Magnificent Global Leader. I'm the CEO of Vision Alignment, and the, the Global Leader is powered by Vision Alignment. And I'm going to hand it over back to the goddess of New York, Tatiana, who is one of my favorites out there for the Global Chamber. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Patty. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope to see you at our next webinars. You can always reach us at globalchamber.org or newyorkglobalchamber.org. We'll be happy to help you with any kind of uh, requests. So you name it. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.